like to introduce to you Dr. Kushki. She is a lab veterinarian for Upwell, which is a nonprofit organization. She has, so she's basically volunteering. <laughs> she has been collaborating with the Florida Atlanta University Marine Laboratory since 2019, working to optimize leatherback care and health. Dr. Kushki's research focus focuses on the impacts of climate change on leatherback hatchlings and post hatchlings. And she'll explain the difference in those two. <laughs> Dr. Kushki is using the skin microbiota and various blood values to estimate health and identify changes in these markers that are correlated with increasing nest incubation temperatures. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kushki. Hey everyone, I'm super glad to be here today um, to share with you about my work. Um, before I jump in, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and stop me um, along the way, as well as hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, but if you don't understand something, please, please ask. So I'm going to be talking today about the impacts of rising incubation temperatures on neonatal leatherback skin as well as their health. Uh, this is just a quick outline of where we're going to go. We're going to start with some background and go into my hypotheses, some of my methods, an intro to some of the blood values, blood findings, microbiota intro, findings, conclusions, and then jumping into our One Health aspects and implications and then future work. So currently there are seven species of sea turtles in existence. My favorite is the leatherback and that's who we're gonna be focusing on today. I currently work at the FAU Marine Laboratory in Boca Raton, Florida. And this is one of our, our few of our turtles in the lab here. We are one of two facilities in the world that can successfully raise leatherback hatchlings because they are very difficult to raise. So they're difficult to raise for a number of reasons, um, and they're very different from our other species of sea turtles. The first reason is that they have this very different shell. Um, they're soft-shelled sea turtle species, and our hatchlings have these beautiful little dome scales that they shed as they grow. And then our adults have this soft, waxy skin. And the appearance of these are different compared to our other species of turtles, but actually the composition on a molecular level is also different. So they have different types of keratin that allow them to be more flexible than our hard shell species. And then this is just an image to kind of give you an idea of how nice and smooth and leathery the adult leatherback looks. So another difference from our other species is that they're obligate jelly consumers. Uh, so this is a leatherback eating a laboratory gel-based diet that we've manufactured. These are just some of their normal uh, potential prey in the wild, but this is one of the reasons that they're so difficult to maintain in a captive setting for research um, because their, their diet is very difficult to produce. Uh, some of the other differences, they have deeper nests than other species. So this is a female currently dropping her eggs into the nest. Their incubation is a little bit longer than other species, so it goes to roughly 60 days, although if it's a cooler nest, it'll be longer, and if it's a hotter nest, that speeds up. We believe their optimal te nest temperature is somewhere between 25 and 31 degrees Celsius. So if they're so hard to maintain, uh, they're so different. Why, why do we care at all? Why do we want to study them? Well, leatherback populations in the U.S. are all considered endangered, and they're listed on the IUCN red list as vulnerable. However, there are certain subpopulations, like the one on the west coast of the United States, that are facing extinction in the very near future. So this population has been in decline for quite a number of years, and is anticipated to be extinct in about the next 50 to 80 years. So it's important that we start understanding what's going wrong with these animals so that we could potentially stop it and prevent these animals from becoming extinct. And this population on the West Coast uh, is di genetically distinct from the one on the East Coast of the United States. And so it would be a real shame if they do end up extinct. So the problem, obviously with most issues, it's a multifactorial issue. However, as we all know, and as the title of my talk implies, 
temperatures around the world have been climbing for many years and they are only continuing to do so. So this is negatively impacting turtles, both in the water as water temperatures rise, but it's also negatively impacting turtles in their nests when they're incubating because beach temperatures are also rising. So they're competing or they're combating temperature increases on land and in the water. So this study came out uh, last uh, two years ago uh, by Dr. Justin Prawl and his colleagues and found that turtles coming from later season nests, so presumably hotter nests, are having alterations in their blood values that suggest they're dehydrated and potentially facing inflammation. So if this is happening in our nests, what other aspects of health could be affected by increasing temperatures? And that's kind of what drove me to investigate what I am. And so my hypotheses for my work are that hatchlings incubated in warmer nests have significantly altered blood values. Some of the same ones that were already studied as well as some new ones and altered skin microbiota compared to those incubated at cooler nests or in cooler nests. So jumping into my materials and methods, all the turtles that I use for my research come from naturally oviposited nests or natural nests on the beaches in Boca Raton and Juno Beach, Florida. And then after they emerge from their nests, the turtles are maintained at the FAU Marine Lab for an ongoing unrelated study. In each nest, we have a data logger and it records incubation temperatures every 15 minutes. And this is what one of our data loggers might look like. So those are placed either the, at the time of opposition or the next morning. Then I sample our turtles at two time points. I sample the day they emerge from their nest. And then again, in three to four weeks, uh, samples are blood is drawn from the external jugular vein, and then I perform full body swabs on the turtles. The blood's used to run packed cell volume, total protein, and algorose gel electrophoresis. And then the swabs have DNA extracted and are sent off for bacterial and fungal sequencing at the University of Tennessee's genomics core. So I'm um, not sure who all we have present today, but I just wanted to do a basic overview of some of the blood values that we're looking at uh, for any of you who are not veterinarians, but packed cell volume is essentially an estimation of the volume of red blood cells in your blood. Total protein is an estimate of all the proteins in the blood. It's usually composed of albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen. And then serum protein electrophoresis takes that all those proteins and then separates them out based on their physical properties. So serum protein electrophoresis produces a graph like this and the different sections of this graph are used to produce uh, values for each of these fractions. And so the first fraction is prealbumin, which for turtles is usually zero or close there to. The next is albumin, which makes up most of the blood. And then our next four alpha one, alpha two, alpha beta and gamma are all uh, globulins uh, that generally are associated with the immune system and immune reactions. So next thing I'm going to talk about is our temperature data. So we, as I said, we get temperature at 15 minute intervals for roughly 60 days. So we've got thousands of data points for a single nest and I have to convert that into something usable to classify our nests as either hot or cool. And to do that, um, Taking the average is not very effective because a few data points can really throw an average off. And so instead of that, I actually create a percent of time of incubation spent at or above 30 degrees Celsius. So I take the time spent at or above 30 degrees Celsius divided by total incubation and multiply it by 100 to get this percentage. I then use this percentage to classify our groups in either cooler or hotter and I separate them at the 51% mark. So turtles spending less than 51% of incubation at or above 30 degrees Celsius are in our cool group. And those spending more than or equal to 51% of incubation time at or above 30 degrees Celsius are in our hot group. So from now on, I'm just gonna refer to them as our cool group and our hot group. 
So we're gonna look at some of the impacts of incubation temperatures on blood values at emergence. So at emergence, it's the day they come out of their nest and they're considered hatchlings at this time point. So looking at this, we've got a box and whiskers pot. Um, just to refresh anyone who hasn't looked at one for a while, we've got our box, which are the edges of our, our first and third quartile. Our whiskers are our minimum and maximums. And then our, our dark light in the center is our mean. And so looking at this, we can see that our hot turtles um, have higher pack cell volumes than our cooler turtles. And the difference between these groups was significant. Um, so I also looked at our beta globulins, which is one of the values produced on agarose gel electrophoresis. And again, we had an increase in our beta globulins in our turtles emerging from our hotter nest than it was indeed significant. So we had no other values had any significant differences between groups. And what do these blood findings mean? Well, we've got increasing temperatures leading to an increase in our pack cell volume and an increase in our beta globulins. So pack cell volume, when we have an increase in it, we generally believe that it's uh, indicative of dehydration. So this is in line with the paper that was published back in 2021 by Dr. Justin Peralt. They also found increased pack cell volume in turtles coming from hotter nests. And then our increase in beta globulins we generally associate with either inflammation and or can indicate infection. So they did not measure this value in the paper back in 2021, but they did find other values that indicated the same thing. So we're seeing alterations in our blood values indicating dehydration and inflammation in our turtles coming from hotter nests. Now we're gonna jump into our microbiota data. Um, but before we do that, I just want to review a few terms for us that we're going to talk about with regards to our microbiota. So just defining microbiota, it's essentially the community of organisms on the skin in this case uh, that generally is composed of bacteria, fungi, and archaea. And it functions to aid the skin in defense against the outside world. But we also know that microbiota have a significant role in health resistance to disease, immune function, response to stress, as well as to disease clearance. We have different measures of diversity that we're gonna be looking at. Um, so alpha diversity, this is the diversity on a single turtle or from a single sample. So for us, it's gonna be the diversity on individual turtle skin. Beta diversity is the diversity comparison between two groups. So how different or are these two groups are hot and are cold significantly different? And then lastly, we're gonna be talking about relative abundance, which is a proportion or percent of different organisms. And usually we break this into uh, percents in our case. Then lastly, dysbiosis is a term I'm sure that some a lot of us have heard by now. I know we have a lot of um, there's a lot of media and uh, up and coming information on human gut microbiota and dysbiosis and things like that. But to define it, it's just an imbalance of our normal microbes in a specific community. So in our case, it's gonna be on the skin of leatherbacks. We generally associate dysbiosis with a decrease in diversity, which is generally thought to be as bad. And then we believe that it can indicate disease. However, all of these are just generalizations based on our current knowledge of the function and importance of microbiota. Um, and we're st there's still a lot, of, a lot of things to be learned about microbiota, dysbiosis, and, and all the roles that these can have and what they can do. So jumping into our first uh, round of microbiota information, we're gonna be looking at how temperatures are impacting bacterial microbiota on the skin of leatherbacks at emergence. So this is on the day they come out of the nest. First thing is looking at relative abundance. So on the left, we've got our turtles from hot nests, and then on the right is turtles from cooler nests. And essentially looking at this, just relative abundance doesn't seem that different. The three major, the three most um, abundant bacterial families are, uh, indicated with these red arrows here. And it, it, essentially they look pretty similar. Um, 
So moving on to our types of diversity, so our alpha diversity, which is the diversity on the individual. Looking at this, we had a significant decrease in alpha diversity on the skin of hatchlings coming from hotter nests. Um, and so that means our turtles coming out of cooler nests have a more diverse array of fun, uh, bacteria present on their skin. Our alpha, di or sorry, beta diversity, um, or the diversity between our two groups. So comparing our diversity of the hot group to the diversity of our cool group, and we found that there was indeed a significant difference in these two bacterial communities. So we've got increasing temperatures leading to a decrease in alpha diversity and a significant de decrease of difference in beta diversity. This decrease in alpha diversity is generally thought to indicate dysbiosis. So we've got decreasing diversity on the individuals, potentially indicating dysbiosis or maybe an overgrowth of a specific microbe that's preventing the growth of other microbes. And then our beta diversity is significantly different, which just means the communities present on these two groups of turtles are actually different. So let's look, we took a look at bacterial microbiota um, between our two time points. So hatchlings, which is the day they emerged, and then our post hatchlings, which I sampled at three to later. Uh, and so I wanted to compare these two groups to see if there were any differences. So looking at our relative abundance again, on the left, we've got our hatchlings on day one or the day of emergence. And then on the right, we've got our post hatchlings at three to four weeks of age. And it's pretty obvious here that we have a big shift in our most abundant um, family. So on our day one, we've got this dark green, Morexelliaceae is our most abundant family, but then three to four weeks later, Flavobacteriaceae becomes the most abundant family. So there's a shift that's happening from day one to three to four weeks later. Then looking at our beta diversity between these two groups, so day one versus our post-hatchlings at three to four weeks later, they are indeed significantly different. So comparing a microbiota at different age points, we see a shift in the most abundant bacterial family at three to four weeks. And then we have a significant difference in our beta diversity. For our shift in microbiota, um, our most abundant microbiota, this could be a normal shift, right? As we age, we could be seeing a normal change in microbiota, but it's all could also could be due to being in the laboratory. So we have a pretty intensive way of um, treating the water that our turtles are in. And so this could be impacting this shift or causing this shift. And so we need to look further into why we're having this shift and if it's normal, or if we want to start trying to prevent that shift from happening. Um, but we do know there is a significant difference between these two groups. So next I looked at fungal microbiota. And before we do that, I wanted to, or what I had to do um, was make some changes to our temperature classifications because fungi are a little bit more resistant to heat, especially environmental fungi, which are the ones that are most likely present on the skin of our turtles. Um, they get exposed to a lot of UV light as well as heat. So they're, they're very hardy in the environment. And so I bumped up our classification of hot and cool nest for our fungal groups. So instead of the percent of incubation spent uh, uh, above 30 degrees Celsius, I converted it or changed it to 31 degrees Celsius. So I took the percent of incubation spent at or above 31 degrees Celsius and then classified our groups again. Because I went up to 31 degrees, I took our percentage um, kind of split mark a little bit lower um, to make sure that we had a nice even range on both ends of this group. And so our cooler turtles spent less than 35% of incubation at or above 31 degrees Celsius. And then our hotter group spent 35% or more percent of incubation at or above 31 degrees Celsius. So from now on, 
our for all of our fungal uh, microbiota data, our cooler and our hotness will be classified with this new percentage. So looking at our fungal communities at emergence, so this is day one, the day they come from the nest, and just at quick glance, it's pretty obvious that there's a big difference between our hot and our cooler group. Um, so hot is on the left, cooler is on the right, and cooler just has this beautiful blue unknown uh, classified group of fungal pre fungi present. However, our hot group has this big pink bar that is not present in our cooler group. So there is a new fungal class present on the skin of turtles coming from hotter nests. Uh, the assessment of alpha and beta diversity at emergence are still in progress. Uh, we still have more data coming in to assess these. So at emergence, we've got increasing temperatures leading to the presence of the class Sordariomycetes on the skin of turtles. This class of fungi contains the Fusarium species, which is a known pathogen to both leatherback eggs as well as leather bass back post hatchlings. So this could be pretty significant and this may indicate some dysbiosis or overgrowth of fungi within this. And this could lead to repercussions later in life for these turtles. So this is something that we need to look into further and figure out if this is truly an issue or if this is gonna be okay. Um, this is just an example of the disease that that fungi can cause. So on the left is an egg with this dark gray patch on the top, which is a fungal mat caused by Fusarium species. Ooh, I didn't do that. Somebody drew on there. <laughs> um, and then, ooh, sorry. Then on the right is a skin lesion caused by Fusarium species on a post hatchling. So I'm not sure if anybody's keep, I don't know how to get rid of that mark. Um, but I guess we will continue. So um, I also looked at the incubation temperatures impact on fungal communities at three to four weeks of age. So these are our post hatchlings. Looking at our post hatchlings, alpha diversity of the fungi present on their skin is significantly decreased in turtles coming from hotter nests, where it, uh, diversity is higher and on these turtles coming from cooler nests. Okay, um, and then I compared beta diversity and found that these two communities are indeed significantly different. So we've got increasing temperatures causing a decrease in alpha diversity again, and this decrease in alpha diversity, um, again, could potentially indicate some dysbiosis of the fungal microbiota present. And the beta diversity just shows that we do have significant differences between these two communities um, emerging from hotter nests. So some of the big conclusions that we find from this is that we've got changing um, blood parameters su suggest that Increased nest temperatures are indeed physiologically straining hatchlings at emergence. We've got changes in the microbial communities. We are seeing it in bacterial and fungal. Suggests that nest temperatures are altering the skin microbiota at emergence and may result in dysbiosis of the skin. And then skin fungal microbiota communities are still different even at three to four weeks of age. So I guess the question is, why does this matter? Why, why does this affect turtles? Um, who cares, right? Well, I think we need to think about what it is like to be a hatchling, right? So we've got hatchling is in its, in its nest, roughly 70 centimeters under the sand emerging, and they have to crawl out of the nest and make their way to the surface, where then they have to crawl to the water and then they need to swim to their offshore nursery, nursery sites, all while escaping predators, as well as the other things that could potentially prevent them from doing this successfully. So essentially it's pretty hard to be a hatchling. So 
it's already difficult to be a hatchling, right? They've got a lot of things working against them. And if we throw these extra things at them, extra challenges, whether it's dehydration, inflammation, altered microbiota, it's going to make it even harder for them to survive. So suboptimal physiologic states, like I've said, dehydration, inflammation, skin dysbiosis can negatively impact overall fitness and survival of these turtles. We already have hatchlings uh, only surviving at a one in a thousand rate. But if that number continues to get smaller, we're going to have even more issues on our hands. The next thing is microbiota changes, especially those fungal changes, are persisting over time. So at three to four weeks of age, there's still differences in diversity of the fungi present. And this could lead to breakdowns in the skin barrier that could result in disease and ultimately death. So again, Another, another thing for them to com compete against and to survive against. And then lastly, global temperatures are continuing to rise and these issues are only likely to continue to get worse. So how does this relate to One Health? Um, that's the big question, right? That's why we're all here. Uh, we're not only concerned about turtles, which we are concerned about them, but also uh, what are the other factors involved here? So for the big picture in leatherbacks, we've got increasing temperatures in the water as well as on our beaches, leading to dysbiosis in the microbiota on their skin, uh, as well as other physiologic abnormalities, and it's leading to downstream effects in leatherbacks. So decreased survival and fitness, potentially disease, uh, skin disease, um, increased overall survival. However, the part that I think we're going to focus in on right now is going to be this dysbiosis on the skin. So if this dysbiosis is occurring in the nest, it is most likely coming from the sand. Um, that's where there's a lot, of, a lot of microbiota present already in the nest. And so if dysbiosis is happening on the skin, it's most likely starting in our nest sand, which is all over the beaches as well as in the ocean. So increasing temperatures could be leading to pathogenic organisms being present in higher numbers on our beaches, in sea turtle nests, but just on the sand and present within the sand as a whole. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a, a, an example of this specific to what we've already kind of talked about which is the Sordariomycetes class of fungi, which we know causes sea turtle egg fusariosis and then mycotic dermatitis in our post-hatchlings. Um, so this, this is all caused by fusarium species. However, fusarium doesn't just cause disease in leatherbacks, in eggs, or in post-hatchlings. There's a lot of different uh, reports of fusarium causing disease in the world, in marine animals, in captive settings, and in the wild, in humans, especially in compromised humans, and then in plants. It's very prevalent in plants. So the thing that all of these have in common, besides being affected by fusarium, is that you can find all of these at the beach. So if we have this pathogen present, and then we have all of these potentially living things also present, we could be having disease events. So how might increased fusarium or another microbe affect all of these things? We're going to kind of go through them one by one. So starting with animals, besides the sea turtle and besides the leatherbacks, uh, we also have lots of other animals that use the beaches for nesting. So there's nesting birds, there are um, Honestly, there's tons and tons of nesting birds. Uh, so if this disease is impacting leatherback and sea turtle nests, it may also be affecting other species of nesting animals. In addition to that, we also have a lot of predators on our beaches. This season alone, I saw probably a dozen coyotes on the beach uh, out there looking for sea turtle eggs. Um, We've, we routinely have predation of nests by raccoons and skunks and ghost crabs. 
these predators that are eating these sea turtle eggs could be exposed to these pathogens, whether it's fusarium or another pathogen that has overgrown. And they could become affected by it. Um, or uh, fusarium does produce mycotoxins. So if, uh, if one of these animals is eating a nest that's infected or uh, severely affected, they could be suffering from uh, toxin exposure, as well as they could be getting this pathogen or others on them and then carrying it with them and spreading it to other places, uh, as well as to humans. We have a lot of human interactions with raccoons as well as with skunks uh, on a routine basis. And so there's definitely potential for a spread from there. And then lastly, we also could see an increased present on, presence on the beach sand leading to an increased burden or presence of pathogens in near shore waters. And then that would lead to an effect for marine animals that make near shore waters their home. Um, so specifically, you know, sea turtles that have made it to the near shore waters, right, and are living there depending on different points of their uh, life, life's history and life story, they relocate. And so if they've escaped it from the nest, but now they come back to near shore waters, which have a higher burden of this pathogen present, they could become infected at that time point. So it's just increasing exposure, which is gonna increase the potential for disease. So next we'll talk about how this could potentially affect humans. So with the advancement that we've had in the world, uh, the medical world, we have a larger number of immune compromised humans in the world um, walking around and with that, there's, that means there's a larger number of susceptible people uh, or potential hosts for opportunistic pathogens like fusarium and like many other environmental pathogens or fungi. So if we have large numbers of immune compromised people on our beaches, this could lead to increased uh, disease occurrence in humans. Then the other thing is we also may be the source of some of these resistant microbes. The fusarium specifically, um, the fusarium known to cause sea turtle egg fusariosis has been isolated from plumbing sources um, and outlet sources, uh, sinks and hospitals in human hospitals. So we may be where this microbe came from as well as we all know that the increased uh, burden of resistant microbes is, is on the rise as a result of not necessarily being responsible with the use of antimicrobials. So as the number of resistant microbes increase, we may see issues with rising burdens on our beaches, just depending on the presence as well as um, how resistant they are and, and fungi are very resistant in the in the environment and most fungi are indeed environmental pathogens or sorry opportunistic pathogens so this is something that we need to be on the lookout for and something that we need to make sure doesn't become an issue for for humans because we don't want going to the beach to become something that could lead to infections for for humans that are immune compromised uh, plants and, and animals, so, or sorry, plants in the environment. So dunes um, are obviously a protected environment and we are constantly restoring dunes, renourishing beaches and trying to implement ways of preventing beach erosion. However, as we start to move forward, we may need to consider what pathogens, what fungi, bacteria we are bringing to our beaches during these activities. And so we may need to start considering pathogen testing when we're planting in our dunes, when we're uh, bringing in sand to renourish the beaches and um, prevent erosion. So these are all things that we're gonna have to start thinking about, um, especially with fungi, um, and fusarium. fusarium is a known plant pathogen. And so if we bring in a, a plant that has this pathogen, it could potentially spread to other plants. Uh, it's generally thought of an issue with um, farming as opposed to our dunes, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't 
make its way into the roots of other types of plants. And then lastly, economic impact. So beaches, especially in Florida, are a huge draw for tourists. And they, they draw hundreds of thousands of tourists each year for you know, people that want to come to the beaches, but also to see the turtles, to see the, uh, the wildlife and that type of thing. And if our beaches become a source of infection for humans and animals, people are no longer going to want to visit the beaches. And then states that rely on beach-driven tourism could, gen could lose a large amount of money, as well as the other um, economies that, so like uh, hotels, restaurants, all of those that benefit from the influx of tourists could also start to suffer. So we need to make sure that our beaches are healthy and are not going to be spreading any type of infection to humans, animals, or plants in order to maintain the economy in specific states. So lastly, beaches are a plant, a place where all of these things meet. We've got humans, we've got terrestrial animals, we've got marine animals, plants, and the environment all come together on our beaches which means One Health approaches are necessary and a One Health mindset is necessary when we're addressing issues that are happening at these places. Because if we only think about it with the, with the one viewpoint, we will forget all the other potential Im impacts that an action can have, uh, especially at a place where all of these things interconnect, rely upon each other and they all just are, are necessary to thrive. So a One Health approach is always necessary. So going into some of the future, things, um, like any good research, this one is ongoing to increase sample size in the coming seasons. Uh, we also want to potentially look at precipitation data to see how that is affecting microbiota and fungal growth, as well as bacterial growth. I'm also gonna be comparing markers of health and hatchling microbiota data to microbiota data from eggs, nests, and nesting female skin. So we'll be able to get an idea of the burden on all of these different places to see what the source of some of these microbes could be and if there's anywhere that we need to potentially intervene. And then, I'm also hoping to s investigate the burden of fusarium specifically on the beaches here in Boca Raton and Juno Beach, Florida, because I do think that that pathogen specifically is a threat to sea turtles, but also to humans. And so getting an idea of how much is here currently and then how much could be here in the future will help us prevent uh, or help us implement mitigation strategies uh, to prevent further further issues in the future. Um, as with any good research, this would not have been possible without the support and the help of all of these different entities. Um, we did have some funding from the Sea Turtle Grants Program down here in Florida. Dr. Deb Miller and Dr. Jeanette Weinekin have been my mentors throughout uh, this entire process, as well as we have financial support from Upwell and the FAU Marine, um, Marine Laboratory. Uh, and the CEM program, as well as uh, Dr. Justin Prawl and his staff at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center are imperative to this work. Um, and Dr. Cray at the University of Miami, who ran our agros gel electrophoresis and consulted on some of those results. Um, and then this is our permit number, uh, the references, and I would happily take any and all questions. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was so fascinating. Um, like you said, it's a perfect example of um, a One Health issue and something that requires a One Health approach. Um, and I just really enjoyed it because turtles are adorable. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or you should be able to unmute yourself as well and just ask in person. We'll give everyone a few minutes. Yeah, great job, Sam. Um, and we probably you might even mention the 
COE program and the undergraduate research program because they have sent a lot of students your way. They um, have, yes. Your Can you tell us a little bit about um, Upwell? Absolutely. So Upwell is a nonprofit organization that is based out of Monterey, California, and they uh, are a wonderful um, organization that has been supporting leatherback work around the globe. They um, essentially find researchers and pull them in and help us uh, perform the research that we're hoping to perform in order to advance our knowledge on the leatherback sea turtle. And uh, the reason that we're doing this is just because, because the leatherback is so hard to find in the wild, there's so much less data on them in general. And so because of that, we're having, we're facing a number of challenges when we're trying to implement mitigation strategies and conservation strategies for them, because we just don't understand them enough. And I believe that one of their goals is to open up a number of facilities around the globe, especially uh, to save the Eastern Pacific population of leatherbacks so that we can start head starting them, meaning that we would bring them into these facilities, care for them, get them to a size where their likelihood of survival is much greater. So essentially give them a head start compared to their friends. And we are making great gains and bounds towards that goal. We're still not quite there because they are very challenging to rear in a captive setting. But every year we learn new things, every year we improve and every year our success uh, is greater. So I think that's one of their main goals as well as they do a lot of tagging programs. So they they tag both adult and uh, hatch, post-hatchling leatherbacks as well as other species to try to figure out where the turtles are going. So one of the biggest challenges, especially with our very young leatherbacks is that we have very, we have no clue essentially where they're going after they leave our shores. It's from the time that they'll leave the beaches as hatchlings till they come back as nesting females, we refer to as the lost years because we have very little knowledge of where they're spending their time, what they're doing, uh, what they're eating, how they're growing and all of those things. And so they're using satellite telemetry to try to fill some of those knowledge gaps. That's really exciting. Anybody have any questions or comments for Sam? I know some of you on this call, I'm seeing names that I know have worked with sea turtles. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I guess with that, um, if there are no other questions or anything else that you want to share with us. Um, oh. okay. uh, I, did somebody else have something? Okay. I was just going to say this, this is all very novel data. We currently don't have any information on the leatherback skin microbiota. And so this is all charting the way for a greater understanding of their skin and the skin health. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the issues that prompted this work was the mycotic dermatitis that we observe in our post hatchlings. Um, and so one of my goals is to figure out what normal is so then that we can appropriately support their skin and prevent mycotic dermatitis. Uh, that is one of the biggest challenges we have in this captive rearing of leatherbacks. And so if we can mitigate that or prevent it, we'll have a much higher success rate with leatherbacks in captivity. Let me ask one more question because I know there's probably a student on here who is interested in becoming a marine mammal or a marine animal veterinarian. What do you see um, maybe number one, the biggest challenge and number two, where's the biggest need? So the big, biggest challenge to becoming a veterinarian, marine veterinarian? Yeah. Um, 
I think finding your way to it because it's it's a very niche place and finding the people that can allow you to step into that role. Um, you know, we we have um, you can become like a zoo animal veterinarian, become board board certified, and that certification does include aquatic animal species. However, that's not necessarily specific to sea turtles, and so or even marine animals. Um, I think that the training for marine animal veterinary medicine is is definitely lacking, um, and it's hard to get the experience even to to work with sea turtles as well. There's a there's a long list of requirements in order to be a sea turtle veterinarian at a rehab facility. Um, you have to have a certain number of hours doing a certain number of things. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest challenge. However, once you get into it, once you find a foothold, um, the people that are already in it are some of the most kind and wonderful and supportive people. Um, so it's a really lovely community to be a part of, I believe. Um, so I think that is probably the biggest challenge. I'm so sorry. I forgot the second half of your question. Um, I kind of did too, but the biggest challenge, but also the biggest need, like where oh. if you, where are, I always tell students that um, there's a lot of needs, but one of the areas where we seem to have very few veterinarians are in, is in the area of inverts, like the mm -hmm. corals. Yeah. Yeah. Corals. Yeah. And to, I mean, I would even expand that and say we are having kind of a turnover of sea turtle veterinarians kind of in the happening. Um, so this is a place to be if you can get your foot in the door. Um, a lot of the, the, the OGs of sea turtle medicine are going into retirement um, and there is a big gap that needs filling. However, uh, like I said, the getting the training in order to fill that gap is is hard. Um, so, but if you have a drive to, to do it and are willing to, to take on challenges because it is a challenge, not having as much information as maybe you do about other species, um, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate that. And I guess if there are no other questions, thanks for joining in, everybody. We'll have another one next month. Oh, next month is you, yeah, the One Health and Humanities Days. So our, our speaker will be speaking on the history of equine medicine, and that one will take actually be a hybrid because she will be presenting at the CBM. All right. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. Great Bye. to talk to you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.